I wanted to start off with a screen that some of you who are as old as me might remember this screen. And does anybody remember that screen? How many people have no clue what that's about? Students, y'all don't know, right? Yeah, so tell me essentially what that screen means, somebody who experienced this. Huh? Okay, it's either off, it's off air, and sometimes it's off air because there used to be a time, believe it or not, where stations weren't on the air 24-7. And then secondly, sometimes it was off air because it was supposed to be on and something was messed up. And, and so the reality is, for many of us, we hate that screen. We didn't sit there and continue to look at that screen, did we? What did we do when that screen came up? Pretty quick. We're going to a different channel of the three channels we had, you know, or whatever, <laughs> Back, back in our day, right? So we would go to a different screen because, watch this, this was not what we expected, and therefore it's not what we were going to pay attention to, and it's not something we were agreeable with. Does that make sense? Today we're going to talk about how that Jesus is the Messiah that no one expected. The Jewish people had in their mind exactly who the Messiah would be, right? He's going to be somebody who's going to destroy the Roman Empire. He's going to be somebody who leads some kind of ultimate revolt. He's going to take over on this planet, in a, in a physical way, they thought, they thought, okay, he's going he's gonna to be able to heal diseases. He's going to probably be a fantastic, he will be a fantastic leader and communicator. But there's some other things they did not expect of the Messiah. And so when Jesus shows up, what I would submit is they kind of saw a screen like that, to use the illustration. And they're like, that's not what we expected. That's not what we wanted. Therefore, that's not him. I'm going to change the channel and I'm going to look towards somebody else. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that today you would help us see who you really are and that we would be grateful that you are the, the Messiah that wasn't expected but is absolutely needed in our lives. You know every person, and every need of every heart. You know those who are joining us online. You know those who will see this or hear this later. And I pray that you would do, Lord, what I can't do, that you'd minister deeply to each soul, that you would correct us where needed, you would challenge us where needed, you would encourage us where needed. We ask in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's pick up where we left off three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, Jesus and his boys, uh, his disciples, had made their way from Capernaum, their home base, we'll talk about that in a second, to the Gadarenes, and they had made it there, and Jesus there cast the demons out of two men. Remember? Threw them into the pigs. They did the swine dive. Remember that, that whole thing? And, and then they... Jesus tells the guy, the guy wants to go with Jesus, and Jesus says, I want you to go back home, tell them everything the Lord's done for you. And he went back home, and he told them everything that Jesus had done for them, and they were amazed. Well, this is right on the heels of that in Matthew 9, and here's what we see, is Jesus stepped into a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. His own town, the town he grew up in is Nazareth. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the place that was his home base. His home base was back up to Capernaum. Capernaum was where Peter's house was, it's where the synagogue was. Jesus had done a lot of ministry there. It's where those of us who have been to Israel have got to go to this place, incredible place to go check out. It's not super big. The community there wouldn't have been super big. Madison is probably bigger than Capernaum was, at least in the number of people and certainly the geography of Madison. So Capernaum's a, a small town off the Sea of Galilee. And what we're going to see now is that Matthew kind of gives us the Cliff Notes version to the story we're going to look at. So there'll be some moments that I'm going to remind you of what Mark and Luke have to say, and you can see where those references are if you want to check those out yourself. Here we go, verse 2. And some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, and we'll talk about what he says in just a second. So they've got a paralyzed friend. And what the writer Matthew doesn't tell us is the detail stuff. He kind of gives us, like I said, the cliff notes. What Mark and Luke tell us is, is that these four friends brought this guy on this mat. They get to the house, but when they get to the house, what's the problem? There's no room. There's no room. So many people were packed into this little house. We don't know if it was Peter's house or where it was. It's in Capernaum, though. And they're packed into this little house that they think there's another option. Likely, there could have been stairs on the outside. It was normal to go up on your roof and, and spend some time there in prayer and quiet time and such. And so they make their way up onto the roof, and they say, you know what? We're going to dig through this roof, pull off tiles, whatever situation was. There's only one way to get our buddy to Jesus, and then that's what they do. Let me ask you a question. You think they're all in? Yeah. Absolutely. Matter of fact, here's what, when Jesus saw their faith, notice this. 
in the text from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, there's never a specific mention of the paralyzed man's faith. There is the four friends' faith that have taken all this time to carry their buddy and then say, we're going to go through the roof. How would you like that if that's your roof, right? You wouldn't appreciate that very much. But they're whatever it takes kind of friends that are going to do whatever it, it takes. They had probably heard about what Jesus had done. Maybe they had seen some of the things Jesus had done. In Capernaum, Jesus had cast out a demon. He had healed other people of various diseases. And so they're bringing this guy to Jesus. Why are they bringing him to Jesus? Just to hear Jesus preach, is that why they're bringing him? Help me out. Why are they bringing him to Jesus? They want their paralyzed friend to walk away from this experience, right? They want Jesus to heal him. And so they lower their friend and probably within a couple of feet of Jesus' healing hands. And here's this dramatic moment, right? All the eyes shift to Jesus. Everybody in the house, the guys from up top, they're looking in, super weird, right? They're looking in, and here's what happens. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, pick up your mat. Is that what he says? No. He says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, we don't know what the people were thinking, so here's what I think they're thinking. I think those four guys are going, what? what? Like we just took this guy and tore up somebody's roof to send our friend down to do what? So you'd heal him. And you're going to say, your sins are forgiven? Other people in the room may be going, what in the world is going on? Like Jesus has healed people in Capernaum. Is this too difficult for him today? What is going on? Many who were watching this, this would have been quite a letdown after seeing that man let down. And here's the deal. We know what the people, the Pharisees, maybe on the front row were thinking because the text tells us when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is what? Blaspheming. This fellow is blaspheming. Huh? Blasphemy. What's blasphemy mean? Blasphemy is a term that means to speak harm. That's what it means. And blasphemy specifically would be speaking harm about God. It would be saying something wicked about God that's not true, or it would be claiming to be God. That's how blasphemy functions. And in this case, we know, based on another text I'm about to show you, that they didn't think Jesus was speaking evil of God. They're very concerned because they believe that Jesus is claiming to have the authority of God. Matter of fact, again, Matthew doesn't fill this in, but Mark does. Look what Mark chapter 2 says. They ask this question among themselves. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They think it's blasphemy. What kind of blasphemy? They say, who can forgive sins but who? But God alone. Let me ask you a question. Are they right? Are they right that only God can forgive sins? It's kind of a trick question. Here's why. We've talked about this before. If you're like, hey, Jackie, you've taught on this before. Yeah, when we did Luke, it's in Luke. So we taught on it. So if you're going, hey, I I recognize this. Good. So here's the deal. If I sin against you, can you forgive me for my sin against you? Yes. However, if I sin against God, can you forgive my sin against God? No. See the difference? This man had not, in any particular way that we know of, specifically offended Jesus, right? And you might go, well, he's God in skin, therefore, but get what I'm saying. He hasn't cursed out Jesus. He hasn't lied to Jesus. He hasn't stolen from Jesus. Get the picture? So what is Jesus claiming? Why is it blasphemous? It's not because Jesus is saying, you did something harmful to me, I'm going to forgive you. No, Jesus is claiming to forgive this man on behalf of God. Do you see the problem? That the religious leaders would have thought this is a real problem. The Pharisees, they had a system. It was a biblical system, and this wasn't it. Do you remember Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? Do you remember what would happen on that day? On that day, the people would fast all day long, and they would look forward to the high priest who would take the blood of of a goat that would be offered. There would be the scapegoat that would be let go. The sins would be laid on that. The other goat, blood would be shed on behalf of the people. The blood then would be taken and sprinkled all over the mercy seat of of the Ark of the Covenant on the Day of Atonement, and the sins would be covered. They'd be atoned. Does that make sense? And this would happen year after year after year. That's the process of forgiveness along with repentance of the people. That's the process. And yet Jesus, it's like he sidesteps that, right? And he suddenly says, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. 
And because, again, this is blasphemous, this is quite a problem. I think they would say, you know, God doesn't forgive through a renegade rabbi who does circus tricks. That's not how God works. Matter of fact, I wonder what this guy's thinking, right? The guy's still laying there, right? I wonder if he has any sense of, oh, my sins are forgiven, or I wonder if he's going, what is he talking about? And then the religious leaders from your community, they're all claiming Jesus is blasphemous, who's speaking of you. Look what Leviticus says from Leviticus 24, Old Testament teaching. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, if anyone curses his God, he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who what? blasphemes the name of Yahweh, in other translations, it's going to use small caps Lord, right, which is Yahweh. The one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh will surely be what? Put to death. You think God's serious about speaking against him or claiming to be him? Absolutely. And then it says this, all the congregation shall certainly stone him and the sojourners as well as the native. In other words, Israelites and non-Israelites who have come into the Israelite community to be a part. And when he blasphemes the name, the name Hashem in, in Hebrew, Jewish people today, many times they won't say, they certainly won't say Yahweh. Many times they wouldn't say God or Elohim. If you see them spelling, they'll spell like G and they'll leave out the O and then they'll put a D or they will say the name Hashem. And this is the point. They take this so seriously. Now, this isn't the only time that Jesus is accused of blasphemy. And I put a couple of places in scripture you can look at in John chapter 8 and John chapter 10, where get this, Jesus says some things, go read it for yourself. He says some things. When he says it, they believe it's so blasphemous. Guess what they begin the process of doing? They start picking up rocks to throw at him and bash his skull in with. And at one point, Jesus goes, for which one of the great miracles that I do are you going to stone me? And they can say in John 10, not because of any of the miracles, but because you, a mere man, claim to be help me. God, this is exactly what these leaders expected. By the way, they expected to do to him. Let me tell you what they didn't expect. I wondered about this, and I touched base with my brother-in-law, who is a New Testament scholar and a lot smarter than me and knows a lot more than me on a lot of things. And I said, David, have you ever heard of? I said, I have never heard of this. One, I'm not familiar with any Old Testament scripture that says that the Messiah would forgive sin. It says that it talks about the power that he would have, the authority that he would have, these kind of things. It, even, even able to cause the leap to, uh, or the lame to leap, right? So the lame can, can be healed. But I don't remember anywhere in scripture where it says that the Messiah would forgive sin on behalf of God. And I said, David, your scholarship is in first century Judaism, the time of Jesus. Have you ever read any first century document where the Jewish people expected the Messiah to be able to forgive sin. He goes, nope. So guess what they weren't expecting from the Messiah? For him to say things like, your sins are forgiven. You see the picture. And so they rather, many of them rather change the channel. And then here's what happens. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. I want you to help me with that real quick. Which one's easier to say based on the results? Which one? Your sins are forgiven is easier to say based on the results. Why? Because if you say your sins are forgiven, guess what you can't see? Internally, that that person's sins are forgiven. But if Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk, he either is or he isn't. Does that make sense? And so Jesus asks the question, nobody answers the question. And the question becomes now, can Jesus really forgive sin? And Jesus is using this as a, as a launching pad to say, if I can heal him of this paralyzed guy, I have the authority to forgive his sin. And watch, the greatest miracle of all that Jesus says these four words is your sins are forgiven. Let me tell you why. Let's say this guy was able to walk for the next 30 years and he dies and he stands before a holy God and he is found guilty of his sin. See the issue? Matter of fact, I'd go so far to say this. If I was paralyzed and I was given the option to walk for another 30 years until I die and then face the holy God and be judged guilty or to stay paralyzed and to stand before a holy God and be judged guilty, 
clean, innocent, and righteous before him because of what he's done for me. You know which one I'm choosing? Man, let me stay in the wheelchair for 30 years, right? You know why? Watch this. You know what Jesus deals with in this guy's life? His immediate need is to be physically healed. You know what his ultimate need is? And be spiritually healed for his sins to be forgiven. And you know what just is true for him is absolutely true for you and me. Our immediate need might be, I've got this physical ailment. I wish God would heal me. I go to the doctor. I take the pill. I, I do these treatments, whatever. Immediate need. It's not that they don't matter. They do matter, right? I've got this bill that's got to be paid. I've got this, this, uh, these classes I need to take. I've got these things going on in my life that are immediate needs. It doesn't mean they don't matter. Watch this. The problem is when the immediate need becomes more important than our ultimate need. And we know people like this. And it might even be the people that we look at in the mirror. Right? Can I ask you a question? Has the ultimate need of your heart been satisfied? Do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know that in Jesus you have been made clean? Those are the four greatest words you could ever hear. I long for the day that I see my king, and I know by the look in his eyes or the words he says, you're my son and you are forgiven. Right? Nothing greater than that. Look what Jesus says, verse 6, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to do what? Forgive. To forgive sins. And so he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And the man laid there. Is that what it says? No, the man got up and went home. Can you imagine? The place is packed. Every eye is on him. They've been going, can he not do it? And Jesus goes, I'll show you what I can do. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. No stinking wonder, right? No wonder your sins are forgiven. Hey, followers of Jesus, we ought to so appreciate the reality that our sins have been forgiven. But you know what I've done before? Maybe you've done it before. Take it for granted. We can live in sin and act like it's not a big deal because God's going to forgive me anyway. Instead of going, there was a great price paid for me and Jesus forgave me, like really he covered it over and said, I'm not going to bring it up anymore. How wonderful is that? If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to live forgiven. You need to live in that, bask in that, be grateful for that. But here's the second thing you and I need to do. We need to go into our community and tell other people that they can be forgiven too. They need to know. Somebody's got to tell them. They need to hear the four precious words, your sins are forgiven. We need to pray for their salvation. We need to offer them the forgiveness that Jesus offers. In the next scene, I want to show you what happens. Matthew introduces somebody. Look what it says. And Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew. Guess who he's introducing? I think he's introducing himself. This is the writer who is also the disciple of Jesus. Out of the four Gospels, I think two of them were written by the apostles. That would be Matthew and John. And now Matthew introduces himself in the story. And here's what he says about himself. He, Jesus, saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. This is choice is super strange. In Jesus' day, there is no rabbi worth their salt that says, I need some disciples. So, let me go pick a tax collector. Let me tell you why. Because tax collectors essentially were social outcasts in the Jewish community. They would not be allowed in the Jewish synagogue unless they stopped collecting taxes. Why? Because they're collecting taxes for Rome, number one. Number two, most of them are taking extra money like Zacchaeus had done off the top to give themselves a nice padded, whatever kind of wallet they would use back in the day, right? And so this guy was not appreciated. Let me tell you, there would be no rabbi but to go, first guy I'm going to go pick out, fourth guy I'm going to pick out, pick out some fishermen. They wouldn't have done that. And let me go pick out this tax collector. No, they would have gone to the, to the elite of those who are educated in the law, those who obeyed the law, not those who break the law from their perspective as a tax collector would do. He's the last guy you would have picked, I think, in Capernaum. And yet, I love this. This tax collector making mucho denarius at the time, this guy says, Jesus, if you tell me to follow you, I'm gone. Do you remember when John the Baptist, he was asked by 
by soldiers, what should we do if we follow the Lord in baptism, right? And he says, he says, don't take advantage of people. And he speaks to tax collectors the same way. They go, what should we do? He says, don't take more than what you need, right? Don't cheat people. But get this. John the Baptist was telling tax collectors to be honest. In this case, Jesus is telling Matthew to be gone. Follow me. And this guy picks up stakes to follow him. I want you to notice something. Who's pursuing who in this? Matthew pursuing Jesus? Jesus, I want to be your disciple. Is that what happens? No, Matthew's probably like, there's no way that would ever happen, right? Jesus pursues him. How good is that? How good is that? Because it tells us, listen, the heartbeat of Jesus is to make disciples out of people that other people would think would never be a disciple. Isn't that great? That's good stuff right there. And so wherever Jesus goes, Matthew will go to. He got up and he left everything and he followed him. Look at verse 10. And while Jesus was having dinner, where? At Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now, Luke's gospel notes that this was a great banquet held for Jesus. In other words, this isn't, hey, Jesus, you can come over because I got some friends coming over and you're going to have a Jewish version of barbecue, all right? It's not like that. He's like, look, Jesus, I want you to come over. I'm throwing a party for you. You've still changed my life. I want everybody to meet you. I want my friends, all my tax collector friends, the only people I can run with, the sinners, those are people who like accept me. Those people, I'm gonna invite them over. Jesus, would you come over? And Jesus is like, nope, I can't be around them. Is that what happened? Oh, Jesus is like, throw the party. Let's make it happen. And Jesus came and ate. And who did he bring with him, y'all? His disciples. And so here, come, here comes this motley crew. I love this. I love this because I think Matthew wanted them to experience what he was experiencing. This reality that Jesus is changing my life and what he, had, what he had done with this man that Matthew probably had heard about at this point, what he had done with this man in Capernaum, this is the one who genuinely can forgive your sins. And I want you to meet him, my friends, who everybody else sees as so messed up. By the way, when they would sit down to eat, this isn't a picture of, we have a long table and you don't get to talk to Jesus. No, they would have gotten in a way where they arranged the, the pillows and such and, and they're on the floor laying where their faces are facing each other. And they would have had several different courses in the meal and there would have been long moments of talk. I can imagine Jesus talking with them. I don't imagine Jesus going, I'm not gonna talk with these people because they're so wicked. Jesus talks with them and cares for them, answers their questions likely. Look at verse 10 and 11. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Huh? Well, here's what I know didn't happen. The Pharisees weren't there in the home with Jesus. You know how I know this? Because they think these people are wicked and unclean and you're not going to enter their house. And it's interesting to me, why didn't they pull Jesus aside and ask him later? I don't know. Maybe they're cowards to do that. They pull the disciples aside, kind of these, these freshmen in Jesus University, right? And they're, they're like, hey, what do you think? What, what, why is your master doing this? This is not, it's not good that he's hanging out with sinners. The disciples don't have an answer, but Jesus did. Look what Jesus says in verse 12. And on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? but the sick. The people who need to go to the doctor are sick people. If you're not sick, you don't need to go to the doctor. But here's what I've noticed. Some people are sick and refuse to recognize they're sick, right? I wasn't going to use this as an example, but my boy Jason for a while had this cough that was ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And finally I said, and maybe other people, I said, dude, you got to go to the doctor. He goes to the doctor. Joker had walking pneumonia for three months, four months whatever it had been, right? Because what ends up happening is we're like, no, I'm okay, no, I'm okay, and we can pretend that we're okay when we're not okay, and we need the doctor's help. You know who was pretending to be okay, thought they had it figured out? These religious leaders. This is shot right across their bow. And it's like Jesus is going, let me see, what's a doctor do? A doctor runs and hides and doesn't see, doesn't go to patients. Is that what he said? 
Now, you know what a doctor does? A doctor goes to where people are sick and he helps them. And he's like, I'm Dr. Jesus and I'm making house calls. How good is that, right? Making house calls. I'm grateful for that. And see, they would have noticed, everybody would have noticed the sick people, right? The really spiritually sick people were in that place. I mean, these are tax collectors and sinners. Who knows? Maybe there's prostitutes, maybe there's whatever. Those are the really sick people. But the problem is, is when somebody doesn't recognize that they're actually sick and they need a doctor. And then Jesus says this interesting thing to them, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In your Bibles, if you kind of cheat with a cross-reference, this is a cross-reference to the book of Hosea that Caleb taught from in Hosea recently. The book of Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Let me tell you what it wasn't saying. What it wasn't saying was, I don't want you to sacrifice to me anymore. I just want you to show mercy. That's not what it was saying. What God was saying to them in the Old Testament was, when you bring your sacrifices, you need to bring an attitude of trust and repentance with it. That's what you do. And watch this. If you've been shown mercy, you extend that mercy to other people who are repentant as well. Get the picture? And so what Jesus is saying is, you, if you want to know the heartbeat of God, go read Isaiah. It's not just about the sacrifices. It's about God's mercy extended to us. And Jesus is going, and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here, to bring mercy to people who need mercy, to be a doctor to those who will recognize that they are sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners. Guess who thought they were righteous? Those religious leaders. They didn't need Jesus. Besides, he's not the Messiah they expected. Who says the Messiah is going to forgive sin? He's a false Messiah. He is blasphemous. And here's what they were doing. They were checking the boxes of the sacrificial system. We've done this. We've done this. We've done this. We do Day of Atonement. We need God's forgiveness, but we've done these things right. You know what hasn't done it right? Those people Jesus is hanging out with. That's who hasn't done it right. And you know what? Here's what I know. What's the difference between Jesus and these guys? Jesus goes to the sinner's home. These guys wouldn't. Right? Jesus makes time for these people. These other people... They're not going to make time for them. And here's the danger for us. Here's the great balance Jesus had. Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Watch this. Without ever befriending sin. Chew on that for a second. It's not great because I said it. I said it because it's great. Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he was, a never, he was never a friend of sin. I love about Jesus that, listen, he, he cares about us right where we're at. He approaches us right where we're at. He calls us right where we're at. But he loves us so much, he's not going to leave us there. Isn't that true? Can God forgive sexual sin, lying, theft, whatever, right? Can he forgive that right where you're at? Yes. And then he's like, I love you. We're not doing that anymore. And I'm going to help you. See the picture? Isn't that right? Hey, church, you know what we have the danger of doing? We can be unbalanced on that. We can become a friend of sinners and become a friend of their sin. Where we think, if I'm really going to be their friend, i got to applaud them. That's never Jesus. Did Jesus ever applaud sin? Absolutely not. Did sinners know that they could come to Jesus and talk with him? Yep. Because many times he was the one approaching them. Isn't that right? And the other thing that we can do, watch this, is we can so say, I'm not going to be a friend to sin that we never become a friend to sinners. Isn't that true? Matter of fact, here's what I think we learn from this part. I think it's pretty cool. Is that we can invite a sinner to dinner. Right? We can invite somebody that we know is not a follower of Jesus, who's not living for him, and we can say, hey, come to my house. I want to spend some time with you. Let's hang out. Let's spend some time together, right? Isn't that true? Let me ask you a question. Do you use your home as a place for ministry? Is it just a refuge for you to go to and we, we bury up in our home? Or can we use our home as a tool to care for people who need to know that Jesus is willing to forgive them? Chew on that. Consider that. 
I want Tanya and I this year to do a better job of using our home as a place like that, right? That we use the tools that God gives us to be a place to say, we, we care about you. And we're going to walk with you through it. But you know what's the danger for each one of us is we can become a lot more comfortable with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the process, we never reach out to somebody who needs us to be a friend of sinners. Isn't that right? We need to do that. Somebody's got to do that. Isn't that right? I love what a missionary named C.T. Studd, what kind of last name is that? That'd be awesome. What's my name? Jackie Studd, right? (laughs) C.T. Studd, here's what he said. This is a great quote. He said, some want to live within the sound of the church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. That's good, isn't it? Is God, will, will God use us to communicate the message of Jesus to other people? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to go across the street, across the ocean, to share the message of Jesus with others? We've got to tell others because the greatest miracle of all, again, are those four words. Your, help me, sins are forgiven. How wonderful is that? Jesus was not He was not the Messiah that they expected. Look what verse 14 says. And when John's disciples, now it's not just the Pharisees and religious leaders, now the disciples of John the Baptist approach Jesus and they've got a question. How is it that the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? The Pharisees in Jesus' day, from what I've read, they had come up with two days that they would fast, a Monday and a Thursday. How'd you like that? We don't eat on those days, right? Monday and Thursday. Now, is it wrong to do that? Nope. It's a, the problem is when suddenly you're, you use your freedom to do that and then you make it a rule for somebody else and that's what they were doing. And so they're like, well, these religious leaders, they're fasting on Mondays and Thursdays and maybe John's disciples are fasting. Why aren't you fasting? Jesus answered that with a great question. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. See, their wedding process, their celebration would be a week long. How cool would that be? Guess what happens at wedding celebrations? There's a lot of food, right? Can you imagine going to a seven-day food uh, celebration at a wedding? You're like, hey, when you want some of this? No, fasting. No. Because you don't do that at a wedding, right? You don't do that at a wedding. What do you do at a wedding? You feed your belly. You spend some time with people. It's a great time. And this is what Jesus is saying. You know what? The bridegroom is here. It's time to celebrate. Guess who Jesus is pointing to himself? I already said he's pointing to himself, right? Good guess. He's pointing to himself as the bridegroom. This is the picture that John the Baptist had recognized too. John the Baptist is like, I'm not the Messiah. I am the one who precedes the Messiah. He's like, I'm the best man, is the kind of language that John used of Jesus. By the way, in the New Testament further, the the body of Christ, Christians are called the bride of Christ is the picture. See the picture? Isn't that cool? And so Jesus gives this picture. He goes, the reason they're not fasting is because right now we're celebrating. Look what's going on. Lives are being changed. Paralyzed guys are walking. Sins are being forgiven. Why are we fasting? We're not mourning now, but the time will come. The time did come when Jesus gave up his life. I doubt they ate much that weekend. They weren't partying the weekend Jesus died, were they? And Jesus ascends to heaven, and there are are times now that New Testament believers could still be in a place of mourning to say, Lord, I need your help, and we fast. is not something that you have to do, but it's something certainly that you can do, and evidently Jesus expected his disciples to do. Look at verse 16, a couple more illustrations he uses. And no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Listen, you young buckaroos, back in my day, we didn't buy jeans with messed up holes in them. We didn't buy those. You know what I'm saying? We didn't, I, I see some of you, the wear them, girls in particular, I'm like, well, did a cat get a hold of you? Tiger, a lion, ripped your pants apart, right? You got to buy those. No. You know what happened in my day? Man, I get a hole in my jeans. That ain't good to come home and tell mama you got a hole in your jeans. Because what mama going to do? They don't go, well, that's really cool, right? I can buy cheap jeans and put my own holes in them now today. But, but what would mama do? Mama's like, give me those jeans. And what's she going to do? She's going to put a patch on your jeans, and I hated having a patch on the jeans. That was terrible, right? And evidently, what they do in that time, you'd buy a patch, and the patch had already been pre-shrunk because the problem would be if you take one that's not pre-shrunk and you put it on pants that have been through the washer a lot, 
and you put it on there and you stitch it in and do your thing or iron on, whatever happens. And then you put it in the washer, that thing shrinks up and guess what it's going to do to that whole garment? It's going to tear that joker, right? And that's what Jesus says. And so the first illustration he uses is, is the same picture of what he's doing. And here's another illustration he gives. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. So the way they would do that in that day is they would make wineskins out of, out of animal skin. And the animal skin, when you put new wine into it, not only is it going to be heavy, obviously, and stretch it a little bit, but as that, wine, as that new wine begins that fermentation process, what ends up happening is that skin through the gases begins to stretch. And it can because it's new. Problem is, if you take new wine, which is grape juice, and you take grape juice and you stick it to, into old wine skins that have already stretched, what happens then? The gases cause it to expand, and eventually the old wine skin that can't expand anymore, what's it do? It busts. Now you've, you've lost your wine skin and you've lost your wine. It's like a you know, big, big problem. See the issue? Why is Jesus using these illustrations? Here's what Jesus is using these illustrations for. Jesus is not about to patch up a religious system where people are not obeying God's plan in the first place. And they, now they've turned a bunch of God's rules into some man-made traditions. And he's not going to go to Pharisees and go, Pharisees, I need to talk you into this. No, you know what he does? He goes to fishermen and tax collectors and a Mary Magdalene who's been demon-possessed by seven demons. And he goes, you know what? You're my new garment. You're my new wineskin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fulfill the old covenant and then we're going to pour the new covenant into you and you'll be stretched and molded and made flexible and you can carry this message to others. Isn't that good? And so we see that Jesus forgives sins and he calls sinners to him rather than stiff-arming them and keeping them at a distance. Jesus is the Messiah that no one expected. But listen, he is the Savior and King that all of us need. He is the one that all of us need. He is the Messiah who did all kinds of miracles, including the greatest miracle of all, to be able to say to you and me, your sins are forgiven. To give us new life, Nolan. To give us new life. That's good. I love hearing that cry. We didn't used to hear that. I'm glad we can. And so challenge real quick. Ready? Hey, church, followers of Jesus, you and I ought to so appreciate the forgiveness that Jesus has given us. Let's not take that for granted. And let's not live for the sin that Jesus died to pay for anymore. Second, we need to take this message to other people. Let's not be the, like the religious leaders that they're like, if you meet this requirement, this requirement, and show up at my place, you can you know, jump through the hoops. And we go to them. We care about them. By the way, in doing that, whose example are we following? Jesus' example. By the way, that's what Peter did when he goes to Cornelius' house. Remember, he's not supposed to go into a Gentile's house, but God revealed to him that he should, and he shows up to the Gentile's house. Remember? Who modeled that for him? His master, the Lord Jesus, should model that for you and me too. And then lastly in this, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online or listening later, I plead with you, turn to Jesus, the friend of sinners who's not a friend of sin. Long to hear him say the words, your sins are forgiven. Bring all your trophies and all your junk and all your sin and lay it at his feet and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. And if you want to talk more about that, we'd love to. Our staff would love to talk with you. Our deacons and wives would love to talk with you. Other Christians in the room, or if you're watching online, other Christians who actually live in their faith say, I want to talk more about Jesus. Tell me about him. Tell me how I can know him. They would love to tell you. I want to finish with this. Years ago, my firstborn son did something he thought would get him in a bunch of trouble. Now, he was 16, 17 years old, so this is a while back, and, you know, he wouldn't do this today. But here's what happened. I get a phone call about 11, 1130, and uh, he's coming back from football game. He's been hanging out with some friends a little bit and coming back after football. And he says, Dad, somebody hit my truck. Like, what? Yeah, somebody hit my truck. Well, you know, can it some kind of color on it? Yeah, there's like a yellow on the truck. Okay, was anybody yellow parked next to you? I don't know, you know, but something's going on. 
Like, all right, we'll take care of it. You get to the house, we'll take care of it. So he gets to the house. I go look at it, and there's yellow on the truck, like some paint. And I take one of those little paint flecks off. off what, what am I saying? The, <laughs> the, the flake. That's, I guess that's the word I'm using. I take the paint flake off of there. It's a, like a bright yellow. And I tell them, I tell you, we're going to go into town because typically there's a cop sitting at one of these stores or whatever, you know, and, and we're going to go show them this and they can take pictures and whatever and we'll figure this thing out. And before we left the driveway, I said to him, I said, Caleb, that's the story. You think somebody hit your vehicle? He goes, yeah. I said, because if that's not the story, you know, if something else happened, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. You know, we'll work it out. Yeah, dad, that's what I think happened. You know, I think somebody hit me. So we're riding. We don't see any cops. And so I make the next step. I'm like, son, where were you? Where were you after you know, besides the football stadium and park there, where were you? And he says, oh, I'm over by Busy Bee. So imagine this, you're driving into Busy Bee from the bank. And before you go to Burger King drive-in, right? To the left over here, there's a, a small building, probably with some motors and stuff in it, engines in it, and, and uh, some stuff they've got, equipment. And, and just over there, I noticed that there is a yellow post. Now, it was in the right front fender, and there's a post here where he may be turned in. And I go to the yellow post, and I take the paint, and I line it up to the post, and guess what I found out? It's the same color of paint. By the way, I, I watch a lot of murder mysteries. <laughs> so my next job, this is going to be it. I mean, i got to figure it out. And I said, son, you ran into this post, right? and there was po there was paint scraped off about that spot on that post. I go, you ran into this post. You didn't feel that? No, I didn't feel it. I said, hmm. He said, I, I didn't know I hit it. I didn't, I didn't know anything happened. And, uh, you know, Dad, I, I, I thought somebody... So here's the deal. And I start putting it two and two together. I'm like, wait a second. You called me from Busy Bee. You know, I'm putting it together. So we head back to the house. And it's like midnight, Tanya's asleep, and he and I are in the living room, and I go, son, you ran into that post. Well, I didn't know I ran into that post. I said, I think you know you ran into the post. And so I pulled him close to me, and I looked him in the eyes, and I go, why would you lie to me because you ran into this post? He didn't say anything. He's like You're trying to plead the fifth. I, I didn't do it. We get, ready to, uh, we get ready to go to bed, and I'm going to go to bed kind of ticked, you know, angry, not that he ran to the post, angry that he's lied to me. And uh, he goes, Dad, I, I was afraid. I was afraid of what you would do. This is my first accident, and I was afraid of what you would do. I said, son, before we pull out of the driveway, I told you, if you had done this, it's okay. Let's talk, right? He's like, yeah. So we're getting ready to go to bed, and meets me at the hallway. He looks me in the eyes and he goes, Dad, I'm sorry. And I teach my kids, we don't just say I'm sorry and that's it. We apologize for what we've done and ask somebody to forgive us for what we've done. And I said, son, you know how this works. What are, you, what are you asking forgiveness for? He says, please forgive me for lying to you. And I said, tough, it's too late. And that was the story. No. I, pulled, I pulled my boy to me and I whispered in his ear these words. I knew what happened 30 minutes ago. And I was willing to forgive you 30 minutes ago. Matter of fact, in my mind, I've already forgiven you. And so it's over and it's forgiven. And I, I told him with, with his, my mouth towards his ear, I said, son, this is, this is what God's forgiveness is like. That he wants to forgive you. He's willing to forgive you. And you know what I was thinking about later? I was thinking that maybe that moment is for my son in the future. That he sees that he can turn to the God who loves him and who will forgive him. But watch this. Maybe it's for the next generation too. Maybe it's for my future grandson or granddaughter that my son is going to have to say to that rascal when that rascal lies to him. Right? Right? And when that rascal asked for the legitimate forgiveness, that Kayla would be like, I've seen this happen before, right? I've seen what mercy extended from my dad looks like. I'm going to extend mercy to my children. 
to the next generation. Does that make sense? Now that story isn't, it's not just about me and Caleb and my future grandkid, right? It's about us. We've been forgiven much. We've been shown much mercy. Is this not true? We need to be those who are willing to forgive others. And we're, we're on the cusp of, if they just say, yeah, it's over, right? If they say, please forgive me, absolutely. I was ready to forgive you before. And listen, we need to take this and we need to extend this kind of mercy and this kind of forgiveness to the next generation, don't we? That's what we need to do. And so I pray that God uses that in your life. I'm going to pray for you, and i got a couple really cool things to share, and we'll be out. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the truth of your Scripture. I thank you that you forgive us, and that we can trust you with that. For those who turn from their sin, my prayer is that believers in here who have trusted you with forgiveness of sins, that they would walk with their head held high, not out of pride or arrogance, but of gratefulness and confidence in you and what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Then, Lord, that you would use us to extend that forgiveness to others, to communicate the the great mercy that you give, that you desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so when we sacrifice, it's because of the mercy you've extended to us, and we're grateful in it. And then, Lord, I pray that you would use this, use us, to see others who need to know your message of grace, and that they would come to know you, Lord Jesus, that they would put their trust in you, they would turn from their sin. Maybe somebody even hearing this today would bow their knee and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my and name their sin to you. Forgive me, Lord. I will follow you the rest of my life with your help. Put their trust in you. That's what I ask in your mighty name. Amen.